Shalom. Oldest Gate Day is celebrated to commemorate the day in 1738 when John Wesley experienced assurance of his salvation. At a group meeting on Aldersgate Street in London on May the 24th at about 8.45 p.m., John Wesley felt his heart strangely warmed when he heard a reading from Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. In his journal, Wesley wrote, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Let us arise for the call to worship. Lord God, our soul is wandering. Where shall our wandering soul begin? When darkness and clouds around us roll, what we long awaiting seems shaking up. Lord, you shall in the clouds appear. In this thick darkness of our soul, you are, you are the great, great invisible coming, coming near, and, and when, when you do, the veil remove. And when your glory you reveal, our fear, our fear shall all be lost in love. Daughters and sons of God, fling wide the portals of your heart. Make it a temple set apart from earthly use for heaven's employ, adorned with prayer and love and joy. For the opening hymn, we shall sing Christ whose glory fills the skies. of hope responsively. On every occasion of uneasiness or being disoriented, we should retire to prayer that we may give place to the grace and light of God to form our resolutions without being in any pain about what success they may have. In the, in the greatest, greatest temptations or challenges, a single, single look to Christ, our shepherd, shepherd, pronouncing his name, seeking the guidance and teaching of our God, to be, be renewed and restored. And, and it suffice to overcome our wrongs and the wicked one, so it be done with confidence and calmness of spirit. Let us now stand for the hymn of praise. Now praise the hidden love of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Shall we say the opening prayer together? Heavenly Father, we praise your holy love that is sustaining us at every stage. In one heart, we acknowledge our need of your unceasing grace to seek you always. Creatures of the sea and land, all are fed by your own hand. Sustaining God, your providence is sure and amazing. Through Jesus Christ, we have come to trust in you, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory, so that our faith and hope are set on God. Lord God, you shine with the brightest rays, and the dazzling bright sun obeys you. Glorious Lord, make us in obedience to your word, so that our souls purified by your word may reflect your glory. The new made earth was filled with light through your all commanding might. Almighty God, with your wonderful salvation, we have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. We seek you now, loving God, even when our strength is gone, our nature dies and we sink beneath your weighty hand, faint to revive and fall to rise. We fall and yet by faith we stand. We stand and will not let you go till we realize your nature and your name is love. And we pray to you, loving Father, with what our Lord Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Shall we say the prayer of illumination in unison? Almighty God, may our hearts burn within us as you open the scriptures to us and give us understanding of your word. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked, and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. 
But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road? and opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, we shall hear the sermon entitled The Wesleyan Flame from Bishop Emeritus Dr. Robert Solomon. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ and take this opportunity to thank Bishop Jay Kumar for inviting me to share this message on this Aldersgate Sunday. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our rich heritage as we remember how the Spirit of God led the Wesley brothers, John and Charles and others with them into a new experience of your grace and power. And as we look into your word, we pray that you will bless us as the Spirit of God brings the truth of God afresh into our hearts. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The name Methodist was originally used as a derogatory term used to make fun of a group of young men who gathered at Oxford University as, uh, and called, it was called the Holy Club in the 18th century. And among the young men were the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley. Now, today, some people use that term Methodist either as a badge of honor or sometimes to make fun of the Methodists, saying that the Methodists are very methodical people. Now, when John first heard, John Wesley first heard the term used against his group, he also knew that it was not an entirely new term, because the term was first used around the time of Christ in uh, Greek and Roman circles, medical circles especially, because there was a school of physicians who were called Methodists. 
And they were called Methodists because they had a method of giving and finding health for people. And basically, if I can simplify it, it involved a method of diet and exercise to find one's health. So they were called Methodists. And when that term was used, John knew this truth. And he, in fact, says, well, it's a, it's a good term because we also have a method for holiness. And uh, we want to promote that and sp spread scriptural holiness across the land. The Greek word uh, that was coined and became Methodist actually comes from two words, meta, according, and hodos, the way. So according to the way. Methodist means according to the way. But what is the way? The way, as we know from John 14 verse 6, is a person, not a, not a strategy, not a method, and so on, not a technique, but a person. Because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. And in fact, the early Christians, if you read the book of Acts, they were called the people of the way. The people of the way. In a sense, I suppose we can say they were quite Methodist, isn't it? The people of the way. And, of course, for us Methodists, to be a Methodist then is to follow Jesus Christ because He is the way. He is the way. And because He is the very method of holiness. And uh, you read this in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8. Isaiah 35, verse 8 talks about the future and what will happen in the future through Christ. Because the prophet saw a highway, a highway that was called the way of holiness. And that is what we understand as Methodists, that we celebrate this way of holiness who is a person. It is Jesus Christ who is the method of holiness. And we are people who walk according to that way. And that's why we call ourselves Methodists. In this text, in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to verse 35, you find how important Christ-centeredness is because the whole text focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the main character on this way of holiness. There are two disciples walking on this road to Emmaus, just like the two brothers who were on a journey in the 18th century, John and Charles. And so from the experience of these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, as well as the experience of John and Charles Wesley, I, can, I think we can derive some important truths about what it means to be a Methodist, to be somebody walking on the way of holiness, walking with Christ on the way of of holiness. First of all, there is this truth about the burning heart. The burning heart. In verse 17, we read that the two travelers were walking dejected and down. The Bible says they were, their faces were downcast. They were sad. They were in despair. It was at that moment that Jesus joins them and the truth is, Jesus always joins us in our journeys to bless us and to lead us closer to himself. And often, when we are down, when the chips are down, when we are in despair, depressed, when we feel defeated, when we feel like failures, when we feel the loneliness and the troubles, Jesus joins us on the way. Now the two talked to Jesus about recent events that were disturbing and puzzling because they were really talking about what happened on the cross, what happened to 
the one who thought so beautifully, so wonderfully, and he was put on a cross in such a cruel fashion that they wondered what's going to happen to the whole thing that he started. It was at that point that Jesus gave them the greatest Bible study because we read in verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus op literally opened the, uh, the, the Hebrew Bible then, which was the, the, the Bible that they had. The New Testament was yet to be written. So he, he looked at the Old Testament, as we call it today, and he pointed how Moses, who was the author of the first five books, and the prophets, how they all pointed to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the King, the Lord. And so it was a wonderful Bible study. Later, the two disciples were talking to each other. In verse 32, they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? We see here an important connection between the Bible and our hearts. Bible and our hearts. Now on May 24th, 1738, John Wesley attended a prayer meeting in Aldersgate Street in London. He was quite dejected because though he preached about faith, he was an Anglican pastor, he preached about faith, deep inside he felt that he did not have any real authentic faith. He worried about it. He longed to experience true faith. He even attempted to serve as a missionary in America, but returned to England as a failure. So he was looking for God in a deeper way. And at this meeting, John had a life-changing experience. And he wrote these words describing that experience, and I quote, In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Wesley heard scripture being explained and his heart was strangely warmed. Three days earlier, on Pentecost Day, the Charles, the younger brother, younger to John, had a similar experience. He was reading Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians and noted how Galatians 2.20 is so personal because he read, he read these words, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The word me jumped out of the text for Charles, and he realizes this is not just doctrine. This is a personal truth. Jesus died, he loved me and gave himself for me. So his heart was also warmed. Like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, as the word of God was opened and explained, 
their hearts were set on fire. So were the two Wesley brothers. They, and by the way, we owe a lot to Martin Luther because it was his commentaries that spoke to the heart of God used his commentaries to touch the heart of John and also Charles Wesley. So both brothers were converted and their lives were renewed. And that's what happens when we come, come face to face with God's word. And the spirit of God brings the truth of God's word into our hearts. We encounter Christ, our teacher, and our hearts are touched. It is for this reason that some, often we say Methodism is a religion of the heart. The heart represents the core of our being. That's where we feel and that's where we think and that's where we decide and choose. So it's the core of our being. And God wants to touch our hearts through His Word and His Spirit. And it is for this reason Charles Wesley wrote those wonderful words of the hymn, Oh, for a heart to praise my God in 1742, four years after the Aldersgate experience in 1738. Let me just read the words. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that sprinkled with the blood so freely shed for me, a heart resigned, submissive, meek, my great Redeemer's throne, where only Christ is heard to speak, where Jesus reigns alone, a heart in every thought renewed and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good, a copy, Lord, of thine. The above verses speak of the heart in relation to salvation, sanctification, and the lordship of Christ, and Christian perfection in love. Wonderful doctrines of the Methodist Church. And it is good to look at the words carefully and to understand the experience of the Wesley brothers and what that represents to us today. The heart that is set aflame is an important dimension of Methodist theology and experience. The second thing we find in this passage are the opened eyes. Not only the heart that is set aflame, but also the opened eyes. Because after Jesus opened the scriptures, he broke bread with the two disciples. We read in verse 30 and 31. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. There are some things to note here. Firstly, in the text, the word and the table are featured. It reminds us of what we do in church, isn't it? The word and the table. The ministry is called the ministry of the word and table. So what do we do in church when we worship God? Question, do we meet Jesus when we do so? Do we meet Jesus when we do so? The two disciples recognized Jesus. Their eyes were opened and their heart was thrilled. When we worship Christ, do we have that same kind of experience? Once, uh, many years ago, my wife and I visited a young family and we were a bit early, so the parents were away at work and we were waiting for them to come. And then uh, their, their little daughter, toddler, was there and we tried to keep her entertained. And then I, I cannot forget the scene of the mother coming at the door. She opened the door and she was standing there at the door and the little girl who saw her mother 
recognized her, had an earthquake, so to speak, in her body. Her whole body was trembling with delight, quivering with delight. And she let out a squeal of recognition. I can't forget that scene of what it means to recognize somebody who is dear to you. And I wonder if that's the same experience we have. The two disciples, their eyes were open and they recognized Jesus. I'm not suggesting that we do this at the Lord's table, you know, when uh, we come to the Lord's table, we have an earthquake in the body and then we squeal with delight as we recognize our Lord. But I, what I'm saying is, it is so important. We need to have eyes that are opened to see the Lord Jesus Christ, to recognize Him and to have a deep experience in our hearts. We need to recognize Jesus and His work in us, which leads to personal holiness. And we need to recognize the Lord Jesus working around us, among us, and through us. And that leads to what the Methodists call social holiness. God working in us, God working around us and through us. Personal holiness, social holiness. If we don't recognize, then we do not understand the ways of God. Because in the scriptures, Jesus did refer to those who will see the kingdom of God. To be able to see the kingdom of God within us and around us is a mark of salvation, is a mark of a follower of Christ, a child of God. To be able to recognize with open spiritual eyes the Lord Jesus Christ and His Lordship in our hearts and around us. So we have to live with open eyes to recognize Jesus in our hearts and in our world. If not, we will live only nominal and spiritually blind eyes. Isaiah began his experience with the words, I saw the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, I saw the Lord. And you know, it was such a profound experience. He goes on to say, I cried, woe to me. I live among a people of, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Then he says, I heard the Lord. And I said to the Lord, you see all these actions, I saw, I cried, I heard I said, were deep experiences which began the time, the moment when Isaiah saw the Lord. And we need to have that kind of experience. Otherwise, we will just be Christians who follow the crowd rather than follow Christ. We will just be pew warmers instead of salt out of the salt shaker we will not display that holiness, that fervor, that passion to follow Christ, to love Christ. It was this truth that Charles Wesley put into words in some of, some of his hymns, and I'll mention just two. First, the well-known Hark the Herald Angels Sing, the Christmas Carol. And one of the verses goes like this, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, Hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. So here is an invitation. Can you see the one who is veiled in flesh? Can you see the Godhead? And he says that kind of vision will change your life. We need to have that experience. Or the other hymn, O Thou Who This Mysterious Bread. There's a verse that says, Unseal the volume of thy grace, apply the gospel word, open our eyes to see thy face, our hearts to know the Lord. What a wonderful prayer. Open 
our eyes to see thy face, our hearts to know the Lord. Open eyes. A burning heart. Open eyes. And then, thirdly, beautiful feet. Because the two disciples, after this wonderful experience, in verse 33, it says, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. It is quite easy to imagine them running all the way because of their deep and transforming experience of Jesus. And there they told the other disciples, they said, it is true, it is true, the Lord has risen. It is true, the Lord has risen, verse 34. And so they told the good news, reminds us of how the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, when she discovered Jesus the Messiah and how he spoke to her heart, she left her jar at the well and she also ran into the town to tell the townsfolk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Beautiful feet. The early Methodists were a missional people, eager to proclaim the good news of Jesus and to spread scriptural holiness across the land. That was their passion. They saw Methodism spread very widely. In America, at one time, it became the largest denomination in the U.S. And there was also this desire to bring the good news to other parts of the world. Thomas Koch, who was an associate of John Wesley, had this missionary spirit, so much so that Wesley called him the Methodist flea. He was jumping from one place to another. He was always looking for pioneering situations to plant the church. So it was on a ship that was headed to South Asia, to Ceylon and India, where he wanted to bring the gospel to Asia, where he died on the way. Truly a Methodist flea. His heart was on fire. He could see Jesus, the Lord who died for us on the cross. The Lord who died for the whole world. And so he walked, he sailed to bring the gospel, to the good news of Jesus Christ. He started Methodist missionary movements that brought the gospel to our part of this world. It was this mission that brought the gospel to Asia. And so today we, have, we are Methodists because of that amazing concern to reach out to the lost world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was those beautiful feet that brought the gospel to us. So indeed, Romans 10, 15, which quotes Isaiah 52, verse 7, Romans 10, 15 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And Charles Wesley, again, he was a great hymn writer. He had so many things to write about. And so in one of his hymns, Forth in your name, O Lord, I go, he writes these, and I quote two verses. Forth in your name, O Lord, I go, my daily labor to pursue. You only, Lord, resolve to know in all I think or speak or do. The task your wisdom has assigned, here let me cheerfully fulfill. In all my work your presence find and prove your good and perfect will. This is the song of one who had beautiful feet, a, a flaming heart, opened eyes, and beautiful feet. The people called Methodists function more as a mission than a church at the beginning. So they were nimble, they could adapt, and they could move quickly. But over the centuries, we have become more and more a well-organized church. And in the process, we may have lost something of that DNA as a mission. We have lost some of that. Now, we cannot undo 
being an organized church is, is quite impossible. We cannot say, okay, we close all our organizations and uh, we function as a mission. Like we cannot go back to our childhood, can we? So, yes, we have, we are an organized church. But we can recover our mission as an important function of the church that we belong to. Recover that DNA. Our feet must move and we must hasten in mission, preaching good news and bringing God's love to the poor and the needy. So what does it mean to be a Methodist? There are several answers that have been offered. But here in this text, we find three good, wonderful pictures of Methodism. The heart aflame, which by the way is our traditional logo in many Methodist churches around the world. There's a cross and a, and a flame, the heart that is set aflame. That's, that's an important characteristic of Methodism. It's a wonderful picture of Methodism. The second picture is the opened eyes that are able to recognize Jesus. A heart that is set aflame by the grace of God as we encounter the Word of God and Jesus Christ as the Spirit of God brings that truth into our hearts. A heart aflame. And also opened eyes. As God opens our spiritual eyes so that we can behold the kingdom of God operating within us, among us, and through us. When you are able to see that, then you are truly a Methodist. And thirdly, the beautiful feet that are involved in God's mission. That's a third picture of what it means to be a Methodist. So may God inspire us, even as we remember what God did on that original Aldersgate Day. The principles have not changed. The experience has not changed. The context may be different, but these are basic principles that we as the people called Methodists need to rediscover, cherish and experience in our own lives and in our local churches and in our denomination. So the prayer is this for all of us. May God renew His people by touching our hearts, opening our spiritual eyes, and making our feet and hands and lips move at the impulse of His love. Let us be truly Methodist, people of the way, the way who is Jesus Christ, following Him in the company of the Wesley brothers and rediscovering our heritage, fulfilling God's purpose for us and our lives. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves to You and pray that in the days to come, you will set our hearts on fire, especially hearts that have grown cold over time. Set our hearts on fire as we encounter the living Lord, as the Spirit of God brings your word freshly into our hearts. And Lord, we pray that you will also open our eyes, open our spiritual eyes, to see beyond the headlines of this world, to see beyond the screens that have kept us in bondage, to see what you want us to see, to see beyond the horizons of this world, to see that which is unseen, that which is eternal, to see the Lord Jesus working in our hearts, working in our churches, working in our world. Lord, open our eyes. And Lord, help us to develop beautiful feet that will bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who have yet to hear 
and those who need to experience the love of Christ, those who are needy and poor. Oh Lord, move us to action, loving action. And in so doing, Lord, help us to fulfill all that it means to be a people called Methodists. Help us, dear Lord, revive us, restore us, renew us, and use us for your glory. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And in response to the sermon, we shall sing a song written by Bishop Emeritus Dr. Robert Solomon himself. And the music was written by Joseph Kamajaja. The title is Change My Heart to Be Like Yours. Arise and let us affirm our faith together, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now, at the time as we offer our gifts and offerings to Almighty God. And let us pray together the offertory prayer. O Lord our God, we humbly ask you to receive and bless these gifts which we present to you, and with them ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Most major achievements in life require training, dedication, and an investment of our time. The same is true with marriage. It takes more than being in love to build a relationship that lasts a lifetime. Honesty would be the main, main thing, really, just being completely honest with each other. Learning your partner's love language. Good communication. Great sex. Learning to listen well. Learning how to resolve the conflicts which will come up. Honest communication. I think for me it's talking, talking and making sure you talk. An engagement is often a very exciting, busy and sometimes stressful time. But it's also a key opportunity to invest in your marriage. The course really um, transformed our relationship, to be honest. It was such an incredible evening. We talked about things we hadn't talked about before. I think it was very enlightening for us. We learned a lot and I would recommend it to anyone. If you want to take time to prepare for your marriage, not just your wedding day, Here are the announcement for this week. India needs our help. Our Methodist Church is collecting a disaster relief fund for the COVID situation in India. If you so desire to do donate, please send your money into the church uh, account uh, via online or else you make special arrangement with the church office. The money will then be collectively given to the AEC, who will then uh, transmit the money to help in India. The second announcement I want to highlight is the praise and prayer, which will be scheduled on the 28th of May, which is a Friday night at 8 p.m. Please make yourself available to come together for this church-wide uh, praise and prayer meeting. This will be scheduled on uh, Zoom as well as on the YouTube. So please make sure you come. The final announcement I want to highlight is the marriage preparation course. If you know of any couple who need, uh, who would like to join in this uh, course, please encourage them to do so. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome all of you who are here, especially those of you who are for the first time joining us and visiting us in this time of worship. I hope that you can drop us a line 
uh, in our church website, our CGMC website. Thank you. Shall we stand for the doxology? for the prayer of dedication we do it responsively you are to be praised O Lord by all your works and magnified by everything which you have created the Sun and moon manifest your glory day and night the mountains and hills burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Our eyes stay open, O Lord, to recognize you and your work in and around us, always. You are the great invisible coming near, revealing your glory, dispelling all our fears. Lord, we confess it is our duty to love you, our God, with all our heart. May your love fill our hearts and be the motive of all the use we make of our understanding, our affection, our sense, our health, our time, and whatever other talents we have received from you. Let this, O God, rule our heart without a rival. Let it expose all our thoughts, words, and works. Then, then only can we fulfill our duty and your command of loving you with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. Amen. For a hymn of dedication, let us stand and sing, Spirit, Touch Your Church.
Now, let us receive the benediction together. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever.